welcome everybody. We're here at the uh, Building with Hemp panel. Just waiting on uh, our fourth panelist, and we'll, we're going to go ahead and start without him so we stay on time, and, and we'll introduce Sergei Kovalenkov when he arrives. Uh, my name is Joy Beckerman. I have been involved in the industrial hemp movements and industry for almost a quarter of a century on both coasts. Uh, and one of my favorite products of the 50,000 products is hempcrete. Building with hemp is a tremendous passion of mine, uh, and particularly not only because of its superior performance, which I'm sure our incredible panelists will describe for you, but also because of the incredibly, tremendously huge environmental impact that transforming uh, our, our today's building materials over towards hemp building materials materials we'll make on the planet Earth. It's with great pleasure that I introduce first John Patterson uh, as our first panelist here. Thank you so much for being with us, John, and you're right here from Colorado. That's right, Joy. <laughs> Excellent. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you have going on with your hemp building company. Oh, if okay. <clears throat> I will stand up. Good idea. <laughs> That's a little more comfortable for me talking, standing up too. Thank you, Andrea. Well, <clears throat> I've been a carpenter most of my life, so uh, always kind of on the lookout for better ways to build our homes. And over the years, I found that there was very few options. Um, uh, but then just a few years ago, I went to some green building code classes for the city of Fort Collins, and I was pretty excited about that. So I showed up, and I sat in a room for three days uh, learning about uh, green, in quotes, building materials. And what I noticed was that most of those materials that we're using to green up our homes actually had more plastics and petroleum in them. And the only goal of the green building industry in the U.S. was to keep the air from leaving the home. And uh, but, but to accomplish that, we had to uh, use more oil. And that didn't seem right to me. Uh, so I decided at that point that I really couldn't complain unless I had a better alternative to offer, so I started doing a little research on the internet, and I found a, uh, green, uh, a hemp building course by Steve Allen from Ireland, uh, uh, conducted by uh, 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 Original Green Distribution, and that's when I met Andrea Herman for the first time and got to uh, really get a good three-day experience building with hemp uh, on an actual job site. And then I came back home, and... Uh, I thought I was crazy for having to uh, have another new passion in my, in my life, and my wife and kids thought that I was a little bit crazy too. And here three years later, I think they know I'm crazy now. So anyway, uh, that's what I found was that alternative. And then once I found that, and that, that's when the true passion in me came out was, okay, I found something better, now i got to do something about it. So I've spent the last few years uh, just educating people and learning more about it and really trying to connect different people globally. Uh, and that's uh, when Sergey gets here. Oh, here he is right here. So I got to meet and had the honor of uh, teaching on the same stage with him in, in Poland. So, um, and then we were able to get him over here for this workshop. So uh, glad that global mission of the hemp building. Uh, they've been doing it in Europe a lot longer than what we have. We've had a few here in the United States, but reaching out uh, for the industrial hemp industry in general, uh, it's a global mission. And so we've got a lot to learn from people around the world. Absolutely, and uh, and thank you for everything that you do, John. I had the pleasure of doing my first hempcrete workshop with both you and Andrea, right here a half hour away. So it's a big part of my history. Thank you so much for everything you do. David Nising, we have you here all the way from the Ukraine. Yes. And uh, we're not here to talk about hemp batteries. You're all over the map. We're here to talk about your hemp building. Please tell us what you're doing. Well, uh, it's it's actually not really me doing it. It's my friend, a uh, very good friend from, from Kiev, uh, Sergei. And um, I've been uh, working together with him to develop these products in, into uh, easier to use, uh, less expensive uh, system which, which the homeowner or do-it-yourself or anyone can use so that it's, uh, it's um, mistake-proof. Take your bag of premix with with the right lime in it, mixed to the right proportion with a with a natural binder, not cement. Uh, you take your bag of herds, which is also measured out to to be the you know, same ratio with the bag of premix, and put it in a special mixer, which we refined uh, to do this. Mix for two minutes and apply, and you can pull the forms off after. Um, after just a couple minutes. But Sergey can talk more about the technology of it. 
I think one thing which is really, really important right now is people are getting sick and cancer rates are going up. And a lot of it's attributed besides diet to our environment, almost everything around us is synthetic. So in, in, the, uh, in the standard um, wood frame construction process in, in the United States, it's really, uh, it's, it's really toxic. There's a lot of chemicals in there. And, and there's a lot of people that are getting sick from uh, molds and viruses that are growing in the walls with pests. And this, uh, this technology with uh, hemp lime construction totally does away with that, and it's fireproof. And uh, it ionizes the air because there's a high pH in, in the lime. Over time, a really interesting fact, the, the wood uh, frame studs inside of the wall actually become petrified. They get calcinated from, from the uh, exchange with the uh, lime. So thank you very much. We're very lucky to have you here. Thank you. And, uh, and in the interest of full disclosure, Andrea Herman is my best friend. <laughs> and also the president of Hemp Technologies, and I'm honored to be the uh, head workshop instructor for our Hempcrete workshops. Please tell us what we've got going on, Miss Andrea Herman. All right, well, how I sort of came into the hemp building verse was while I was working over at Hempwell Canada for many years, uh, we got a call from Mr. Greg Faval, and he was actually working on a beer brewing project for Hemp History Week. And so they were looking to source toasted hemp seed to do this beer brewing project. And he says, oh, this is who I am. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been watching what y'all are doing. It's awesome. Thank you. And he says, we'd love to come to do it in Canada. And I said, just tell me the dates you want to come. It's locked down. So it gave me some dates. The next thing I know, we were doing uh, an event up in Manitoba. And after that, the guy said, we love you. Please come join us in what we're doing. So at that time, David Madera was still alive, so may he rest in peace and know that we're all here greatly on the efforts and passion that he brought us all into from the team that they had put together to do the first projects in North Carolina. So from that, uh, David and I, we started doing some initial workshops. Unfortunately, he went home from our last workshop and discovered that he was quite ill and passed away a few months after that. So from that, you know, we kind of lost a bit of energy, but what was happening was that there was more energy building around us that we didn't even really know about just because of the presence of the news media that we got off of the initial house in Town Mountain in North Carolina, which was built for the mayor, and it was pretty amazing. Joy and I actually had the opportunity to go see it. So from that time, you know, that initial seed that was planted from the work that was happening in North Carolina really spread across the work that was happening in Europe, was coming over here, advice was being shared, and the technology was really being sort of, I guess, rebirthed in that way to understand what it means to work with hemp and lime. And, you know, maybe hempcrete, maybe at the end of the day, is not always the best name because people also often think, oh, I can make roads out of hempcrete because it's obviously a concrete. Well, no, it's not. I'm from a concrete family. My dad actually had to have the concrete chiseled out of his nose passages so he could breathe again because he sucked down so much concrete his entire my entire life so now my dad works for me in the concrete business <laughs> which you know I said it as a child I wanted to join the family construction business but I was a girl and I was supposed to be a dental hygienist or something. <laughs> and now he would never take that back. So from that time, we've got, I mean, currently right now, this month, we have a 3,000 cubic feet home going in Texas. Um, and we do have some workshops coming up down there. There's also an opportunity to do some volunteer work down there. If you are willing to come and stay on a two-week stint, you can come down and actually volunteer at that project in Texas. And then just uh, this past month, which meaning tomorrow, or on Monday, actually, we're going to have um, the herd from Dan Agro in the Netherlands and the binder coming out of Vicat in the France. Um, will be floating to build the first permitted hempcrete home in the state of California. So everybody give a big shout out to Neil Decker and his wife for actually pushing forward that. And it is a two-story round house. 
amazing. And so if we can get a fully permitted hempcrete home in the state of California, it kicks the door open for every other state in it. And it wasn't, it wasn't me who did that. It was the Deckers that did that. It was their engineers. It was their builders. You know, they got uh, advice from Alex Sparrow, which has just written a really great book on building with hemp. So he was giving them consultation the entire time on that project. And when it came time to buy the materials, they looked around at what was what pricing was really available, and we were able to secure some good pricing for them to be able to bring that pricing in. And from my point of view, I don't care where you're getting the material, how you do it, as long as you're doing it well, just get it done. You know, we're all here, like, and, you know, people think that we should be competitors and not be friends because we're all in the same industry. That's not how it flows down because my ass is going to hop into your booth any day and help you be successful, just like I would hope anybody would do the same thing for us. So if you can go to a workshop, please go to one. If you've got any questions, and the thing is, is when you go in to do building permits, that often comes up to us, how do we deal with the building permit? We're talking about a cellulosic infill. You don't have to wave your freak hemp flag going in there, like, you know, try to huff and puff and blow my house down. <laughs> try to make my house full of mold. You're not, you know, just so the thought of cellulosic infill, they really get that. And as long as the structural sound, the plans are structurally sound, really the insulation that goes into the wall, the building code guys aren't so concerned about at the end of the day. So it's a different kind of messaging. We've also just got this past, like a week and a half ago, I guess now, um, the this, this sign, move in sign off on the first home in New Zealand. And they've had over 3,000 earthquakes this past year. And so that's the first home down there to actually seal the deal there. So that's part of the work that we've been able to do with Greg Faval is really go in and really muster through the pains of the building process and say, oh, you can't do that. You have to do this. And then how do we meet them in the middle so we end up winners and empowering the building code people to be winners also so that they become part of the solution in, in what we're dealing with. Because you get one, then you get another. If you're interested, like any of us could be able to come and assist with that, but have a town hall meeting, engage the builder and permitting people in, in the early beginning so that they, it almost becomes their idea. And then it's their idea, you know, who cares, give it away. Give the idea away, right? You don't need to be the first. You just got to be part of the, the circular motion that we're all in. So thanks, guys. Thank you, Miss Andrea. And all the way from Kiev, we have Mr. Sergei Kovalenkov. Thank you so much for joining us and tell us wow. what you're doing. Wow, you spelled it so right. I don't know. <laughs> A lot of people have difficulty, you know. <laughs> um, how you doing, guys? Uh, some of you maybe heard me uh, talking about this construction, but uh, uh, yeah, I would have to give a big thanks to David Nasing. Yeah, he helped me to let it off in Ukraine. Uh, I'm absolutely uh, astonished by the properties of this material, and I'm not joking uh, when I was saying that we have to pay attention how our ancestors used to build houses and try it yourself. When you try it yourself, I actually lived in the hemp uh, lime house and uh, the feelings are unbelievable. Uh, you sleep less, you're more happy, you're rested mentally, physically. It's, uh, it's real, it's real. No joking, I'm speaking from the bottom of my heart, you know, otherwise I wouldn't be here, you know, halfway across from my home. Uh, so, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I used to study for civil engineering in Canada, and I used to work for many different companies around the world as a project manager. And uh, uh, it was by accident how I, I got introduced to hemp. Uh, I was going for another job to paradise, you know. It was surfer's paradise in Australia on the east coast of Pacific Ocean, uh, ready to work there in another project management company. but. Uh, Things turned out the way that uh, when I arrived, the person who I was, you know, uh, taken for, uh, substituting him, he decided not to quit. And uh, <laughs> I was left stranded. And then I met a great guy by the name of Evgeny, and he allowed me to help them uh, build the first ever house in Tasmania on the island. It's a beautiful house. And uh, there on after, I just... Uh, 
my mind it just shifted completely like the paradigm you know i started to look at the world different especially the construction world and uh, uh, the advantages this material just gives you personally when you build out of it are just uh, you know we can go on and on and on and on i can speak for hours you know sometimes <laughs> i give lectures and uh, it goes for two or three hours when we go into detail and uh, it's quite fascinating even the even the scientists who do research on a daily basis with this fabulous material, they don't know all the things. They cannot explain all the properties of this thing, you know, how it works, how it blocks the cold air coming in, how it regulates humidity. Uh, we are, you know, touching the tip of the iceberg here, but in the long run, I, I believe uh, this is the future of construction. And this is, you know, this country fully deserves to be you know, filled up with these houses. That's that's all I can say. And uh, I'm thinking of maybe the good idea would be organizing some type of community or Facebook community where people, whenever they build a house, they share it, they post photos, they share knowledge, they show that it can be done, they show that it can be done to engineers and <laughs> architects, and, and uh, those are the people that you need to really choke sometimes, you know, for them to understand. Uh, how you know how the how the world spins around you know so yeah <laughs> and uh, yeah, that that's it yeah I'm, uh, I urge everyone to you know to try it out to try out go go like uh, as Andrea said go and try it yourself you have a feeling like I know I've uh, been visiting some seminars when people were building cope houses as soon as people touch clay. They, they come out of that seminar completely different person. You know, they know how they build it. They do it, they do it with their own hands. They, they, they could turn around and say, this can be done. We can build out of coal. Yeah, we can build out of coal. Just like, as I said, a straw bale houses. You guys have straw bale houses that are 100 years old here and they're in perfect shape. What happens to the houses you're building right now, 30, mm. 40 years ago? Mm. I don't have to tell you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you make your decision, but I want you to start thinking, you know, don't just... Don't just trust what you hear, especially from the people that design things and they tell you those are the rules, you know? And it's very, it's very important. It's very important to open up your mind and start thinking. Start thinking what's good for you, not what's out there, you know? And because they don't give you much choice and we are here to show you that there are choices and it's up to you to make. Thank you. And thank you so much, Sergey. Uh, I'm really glad we actually have some time for question and answer, and I'm pretty sure that there are plenty of them out there. I just wanted to piggyback on something that Andrea said that I wish we could sort of name, rename Hempcrete, Hempfill, uh, because again, folks do get that uh, misunderstanding that it's a substitute for concrete when really we're talking about above ground daylight walls, a living, breathing wall. It must breathe. It cannot touch the earth. Uh, if you are going to have part of your uh, your home built into the side of, a, of the earth, you would need some other type of foundation for that concrete uh, or whatever. Um, but it, it ought, it's just more accurately called hemp fill, but we have adopted hempcrete, a mold resistant, rot resistant, fire resistant, pest resistant, optimal indoor air quality construction material. So well, let's see, do we have any questions here? Please, we got some big brains on the panel. Anybody have a question? Yay, yes. Well, I can go around so you know, I, you know, I'm a hemp farmer in, in Oregon, and uh, uh, how much acres do I have to plant to? Uh, uh, so how many acres do I have to plant to build, let's say, uh, a, a 2,000 or 2,500 square foot house? And the other related question is, do you make like four by fours or two or six by sixes, and and use post and beam construction with plywood? And do you make hemp? Plywood. Uh, let, let me, uh, first of all, I don't have a calculator here to go through how And it how depends much. on the variety and the cultivar. There's no way to yeah. answer that question so about plant density. Yeah, so that's impossible. But uh, uh, that said, the standard equipment for making plywood from wood works just fine with, uh, with, with, uh, with hemp stock uh, material. So um, I don't know if anyone's, is anyone making, producing right Andrew, now? Uh, 
Right. So uh, when you start talking about press boards, part right. of the issue there is, I mean, it's really the lack of machinery right now. There is TTS out of Canada doing some press boards are only two by fours. So they're two feet by four feet, so not quite getting to the standard that we need at the eight feet range. They are looking to develop that. There's some really interesting work. I mean, I you know, I'll, I'll just say like, you know, hemp is in, it, it can be in addition to other great things also. So don't forget about the cool work that's going on with like looking at sunflower hall boards. Right, so we want to be, how purist can we be? Well, sometimes we can't be as pure as what we want, but there's other really great alternative products out there that accompany what we're doing in hemp, and we want to also support the other alternatives that are going on out there. So th there is, uh, you know, some opportunity in the, the paneled boards. There's also a great opportunity in panelization period of hempcrete. So these would be off-site built panels. And we already know if you look at the use of off-site built homes, the waste reduction that occurs in that environment because you're able to do things a little bit more efficiently efficiently because I mean you've been to a construction site sometimes there is a ton of waste laying around I mean nails dropped on the ground these types of things so sometimes controlled environments are better I actually you know I teach at Oregon State University and I have lots of students that talk about hempcrete and one you know said oh the wall has to have room to breathe because they actually thought because we say this it's a living breathing wall and what do we do when we breathe we're in and we're out so they really thought the wall was going to be like this and ebbing and flowing but that's not really the case, what's, what's happening. So there is opportunity in, in there, and there are some boards, and you can get some boards coming out of Asia also. And we love Price is Asian fluctuating colleagues. a lot right now, mm -hmm. so we need more, more to come on board. Is there other questions? Right here. Uh, Derek, do you want to meet? Maybe yeah. Are, oh, got it. yeah, thanks. Oh, right here. Uh, sorry, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you've talked about infill. Has anybody looked into or done any research in so far as producing structural uh, members uh, as opposed to just using it for infill? And I'm, what I'm talking about is the, using the resins used from him. Has anybody been As a biocomposite type of thing? Uh, okay. Uh, if you want to have a, a load-bearing member, then you're looking at the product with the with a higher, higher density. Whenever you increase the density of the material, then your thermal values, they drastically drop. You know, thermal conductivity goes up, so it's easier for the cold air to penetrate through. So that's the downside of the structure. Yes, you can make uh, load-bearing bricks out of hemp, but then you would have to mix it with cement, and it's uh, detrimental. And, you know, otherwise, all the companies that would, you know, you know paving stuff with concrete that would be adding some type of, you know, wooden chops uh, like hemp herds, uh, I don't know, like sunflower uh, seeds or something else. Like it's not, it's not possible. It's not nice. Uh, but that's not, and I, un I understand that what happens, but what I was talking about specifically was using resin to produce structural members. He, he's saying it would be thicker and mess with the, with the conductivity. He's talking about which yeah, resin are you, you know, I, talking about? I, I, I don't know. That's um, like, yeah. I, you know, I know it's possible now to create resin from plastic from hemp, which I think is possible. And then, you know, we all know that then it's worth as a carbon from hemp resin. So what I'm, I'm questioning is, is anybody doing it research? It hasn't been done yet. Creating structural members from resin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> people we, looking at it, but it's not resin. It's the it's the bast fibers which which have the, yeah which which carry the strength. There's not really a resin per se in in uh, in hemp. So uh, there are some natural uh, resins out right now, 95 percent, and they're made from uh, linseed oil, from flaxseed oil. Um, actually, they found better properties, not surprisingly, by using hemp oil, but it's much more expensive, you know, to use it for resin. So. Mm. Let's take a question from back here, this gal. And oftentimes I, I'll say too that, you know, would people want to continually uh, like improve on hempcrete as if we could improve on it? And we really can't. Um, it, it's something else once we start messing around with the formulation. So you mentioned um, framing and removing the frame from a hempcrete wall. Can you explain how that, how that works, how a hempcrete wall is framed and finished? I'd be happy to. 
Uh, one of the things we do in our workshops has been very popular. We build tiny hemp houses, uh, and that, that allows people to see the frame, and we try to make it as simplistic as possible. In the industry, as carpenters, it didn't really go that way. More and more specialized and more and more uh, clips and hangers and things like that. And with hempcrete, we can take a little bit of liberty. Post and beam is really a much easier way to frame. It ends up stronger and ends up using less wood and, and works entirely well for, for hempcrete. So we, we frame it just about like any other post and bream or really even a stick frame house. And there's some little details that we've learned, especially on the tiny house, that we were using maybe a piece of uh, wood where we really didn't need it in standard framing we we put an extra rafter on the edge of the roof and with hempcrete it was really kind of in the way and it was better to cut it out really but learning that we just didn't put it on on the next one so it's really similar and then the forms attach on to that framing member um, nine inch wall is uh, uh, what Steve Allen recommends I don't know what you use particularly uh, how wide it is, but you put your forms uh, about wide, nine inches wide. You can put the framing on the inside, you can put it in the middle, or you can put it on the outside. And we go through kind of a whole section why you would want to do it one way or another. It's kind of personal choice and based on how you might finish it in the end, whether or not you would put it on the framing on the inside of the wall, the middle, or the outside. And then there's uh, uh, different forms available, the plastic ones, I don't know the name of the company that makes the black and red uh, plastic, geoplastic. Geoplastic makes a really nice system. I haven't had a chance to use it. We make our own out of scrap plywood that we have, which I, I don't really recommend, but um, uh, it gets you through and it saves you about 20 bucks. So, you know, maybe costs you about $300 in labor the first day that you try to recycle plywood to use for your form. So better to buy those new and make them out of some nice, nice wood and, and good and sturdy if you're gonna build them yourself. And one of the things we're experiencing is making different corners and things um, so that the corners, that, that's really kind of the hardest part to get right. And to space out those forms, you can just use pre-cut PVC pipe and then just fill in those holes with hempcrete when you take the forms out. I'm gonna let you choose who's next, Derek. I don't know, is anybody next? Okay, meeny, 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 mo. here we go. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. Uh, does the hempcrete have any kind of R insulation rating? Ha -ha. Oh, well, I mean, you're approximately two per <clears throat> two per inch, but I think the, here we're often talking about R value versus the U value, which is much different. So R value, I mean, even though we think about it because we want to compare it to pink insulation, it's really not what's important in the concept of hempcrete building as we're talking about the thermal properties of that wall and how it actually will help basically create a cave type sensation. Joy and I also had the opportunity to stay down in the now house down in North Carolina. And I can tell you after the you know first couple of days, you actually did feel different, right? From being in this, in this house and the way that the air flows. Now, one of the questions you were asking, we don't remove the frame. He was talking about removing the shuttering or the form on the outside, just so that that was, we don't, we still need the frame in this sense. Um, so yeah, ap approximately two per inch, but honestly, like I say, it's, it's like trying to say, oh, well, how does it compare to concrete? Like, we're not even going to compare it to concrete. So the, it's more the U value. Scenario. In the European Union, they use the U value, which is conductivity, as opposed to the R value, which is resistance. But I think there is some, depending on the, the thickness of the wall, mm -hmm. we can get up to 2.2, 2.4. And also, not only the thickness, but how much, you're, how much you're compacting the wall. As Sergey said, you start, you know, you really start compacting that wall. And we all have this notion, as we all know from doing workshops, people, we want to tamp. Like, we want to get in there and hammer that stuff in there. No, actually, it's really light. It's just a little light tamping that's got to go on in there, and that keeps it light and fluffy. So the harder you tamp it, the less and less you're going to get of the use out of it as the intentional use as an infill. And we'd only tamp the end. Uh, just a little remark. Uh, you're talking about R value. Uh, just because this uh, material has a great thermal mass, uh, how are you going to evaluate the... R value when you turn on your heater in the winter time and the wall heats up because it can store a great amount of heat. And we're talking about, you know, totally different numbers than obtained in the laboratory environment. And this is important because the numbers you receive 
I and I, I'm going to emphasize on this. I I repeat it again because I, I I said it during the John's presentation. Obtained in laboratory environment. Nobody's going to give you values in dynamic environment. No one's interested. So if you compare hemp lime insulation to fiberglass and mineral wool, it's going to be totally different numbers in dynamic environment because the way this material acts. So, you know, you might find it strange, but as, as a structural engineer, I would say, like, throw these values out of the window because you need to install the meters all year round to see how the material reacts, how it works. And uh, with like mineral wool and stuff like this, it's really afraid of water and moisture. Once the moisture gets in, these membranes, they work for a certain amount of years. After, they don't work, okay? And you're gonna get moisture. You cannot block natural processes. You're gonna get moisture inside your insulation material. And what happens to it, it squishes. You get a lot of cold bridging. Then we talk about those R values in like 10, 15 years from now, you know? And it's gonna be, you're gonna be shocked, really, so. Was there trash in, trash questions? out. Here I come. Thank you, Derek. Um, is uh, anyone uh, doing uh, like carpeting or, or flooring for homes uh, with, with hemp material? There are some coming out of India, some carpets, but n not on a large scale. But that, that sort of leads to a, another concept of, you know, using hemp as a building material if you look at something like non-woven matting to use as a carpet bat, right? So there is a combination of things that we can do. Um, but, you know, obviously what we've lacked in Canada is fiber decortication. So we can talk about how great it all is, but what about sourcing the material? We've got grandfathers of bales sitting around all across the prairies and we don't have a fiber decortication facility, really. You know, there's some pilot facilities, but at the end of the day, we've got to know, and you know, when we're talking about using a material, we've got to know from bag one to container number 70 that that material is going to be the same. So that when it starts getting into these major applications, I mean, our, our whole goal here is that we want to see, I mean, hell, you want to put in a subdivision? Great. I don't, I mean, I don't want you tearing down par paradise to build a parking lot, but man, if you're going to tear something down, you might as well put a hempcrete structure on that building, right? Or on that piece of land. So yeah, there's, uh, there's, there are, there are coming on and there's opportunity there, but we lack the principle processing of the decortication really in North America. And trust me, in Canada, we never thought we were going to be eating hemp foods before we were making car parts because that was like a low-lying fruit. Well, they're doing it in Europe. We can do it here. This is great. We don't have, there's no fear there. But wow, we were eating hemp foods and still now, we're talking since 1998, we are thankful to have our European colleagues to lean on and to be able to start bringing that material in. And they've been so good to us to be able to provide that over here and really share their expertise. So that it's, it's out there, but it's very limited. And be careful because sometimes you'll th see things that are called hemp that are actually jute. I was going to say that too. A company called Kona, K-O-N-A, floor and wall coverings has some hemp floor and wall coverings. But be very careful. You can get on overstock.com and get some hemp rugs and stuff. But really look, sometimes they use the color hemp. It's not the material. And oftentimes it is jute. What else do we have back there, Derek? Uh, so I was just curious. I know David mentioned about how uh, wood can uh, crystallize after over time. Is there any other building materials that you found with the lime being so basic, it having an adverse effect working with? Yeah, de definitely. I mean, you, you, you don't want it in contact with metal, okay? So wood is absolutely fine, but uh, um, yeah. You yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you have to worry about uh, corrosion if you have uh, metal in contact with highly basic uh, lime. So yeah, you have to prime it, you have to paint it, and then it will be fine. Yeah, but you do have to cover metal because you're gonna run into trouble if you don't. I just wanna make a comment to speaking on paint, yeah. is that, uh -huh. you know, please don't put something that's not breathable to cover up your hempcrete. 
right? E latex. It's like, so yeah. So it's like, if you do like a magnesium oxide board or something like that, don't go painting the magnesium oxide board with latex paint, which blocks the natural flow of what's supposed to be happening in the wall. So it's not just about what's going on inside the wall, but it's also how are you doing the renders on the inside or the outside? And this comes to the framing question. So if you want, you know, maybe you're living somewhere that, you know, that you got to do it just like everybody else's house in that neighborhood. So how are you going to handle that? Maybe you want to do a wood siding on the outside or some other kind of siding. Maybe you don't want to do stucco. Maybe you want it to look like everybody else's house in the neighborhood. You can do that, but that's just some slight design feature changes. Yeah, I have a, at our workshops, we have a, a, a plaster expert, Frank Wettenkamp. He, he takes us through the process of actually applying the plaster, but also how you're going to color it. And you don't have the same palette that you get at Sherwin-Williams. You don't have all the different range of that. They're much simpler, much more natural colors, um, but, but a, a pretty decent palette. And, and you need to work with a guy that really kind of knows both the lime plaster and how to make it look more beautiful. We I'm add iron oxide pigments to, to our hempcrete in our workshops. You can, you can actually add it to the hempcrete. If you wanted to have half of your wall exposed, I love the look of hempcrete just naturally without a lime rendering, but I probably wouldn't want it for the bottom part of my house. But you could put some iron oxide pigments in your hempcrete as well. Anybody else? One more? We'll take one we didn't have before, just a new, uh, if we could. Thank you. How about with redevelopment? Say we're getting a house. Is there an opportunity to use hempcrete? Yeah, to refurbish. Uh, absolutely. Your country is designed for hempcrete. You know, or hemp and lime. <laughs> Your house system is perfect. You know, you you have a load bearing frame, wood frame. That's all you really need. You just take all that. Can I use the word? But uh, yeah out of your <laughs> out of your house clean clean it up and then yeah uh, you know take a look uh, what the condition of your wood frame of course you have to inspect uh, maybe ideally with engineer because there could be some bad processes happening over the year depending how old your house is and what materials were used but yeah absolutely e e you you must <laughs> you must use uh, hemp and lime, you know, it's in renovation projects. Uh, I urge you, yeah. It, it's our duty. It's our duty. And, and, yeah, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm being so pushy yeah. sometimes. Yeah. You just better go out there and do it. I think part of the thing also is in remodels that I've experienced talking to people is that you, you tend to, you'll lose a little bit of the floor space because you're going from, you know, what it may be a three, four inch wall now to a maybe, you know, maybe up to five all the way up to nine. So that's part of the sort of give and take when we start to look at that, like how much space do we actually need in our homes? And now I've been on the big downsizing kick. So let's just buy less crap to put in our home and then we can give ourselves these remodel jobs that we need so that's part of the fear is you know oh I need to have this and one of the other things that we didn't talk about is how how are we going to hang things from in in this home you know, we want to have the big television that hangs on the wall. We got to prep for that in the plans. We want to have the the counters on the wall. How are we going to prep for that? And that's all part of that design feature that you do. So maybe in some of the some parts of the house, you're actually building a little bit different to facilitate what you want to put in the house. Thank you so much, sweetie. We have someone else, another a whole other panel coming in to use the room in 60 seconds. So we're going to end our building with hemp panel here. A couple of things, though, that I did want to, a couple of things I do want to make sure you leave with, folks, is please, if you've not worked with hempcrete before, do not attempt to make your own lime mix binder by a premix binder. It sounds like there are a lot of them out there. We don't care where you buy it from, but by a premix binder. And I love that both David and, and uh, Sergey and our company, Hemp Technologies, and probably even talk with John after local here in Colorado, where you can get the bag of herd per the bag of binder. It's very easy. Bag of herd to bag of binder. You want a consistent mix. That's very important. And also to get your architects to speak with some people who are experienced in hempcrete while they do their design. Do not think about hempcrete as an afterthought. It should be thought about in the actual design of your building. Just wanted to make sure he said that. Thank you so much for coming. And get to a workshop. They're all over. Thank you, everybody.